Now it's time to introduce our first speakers and I'm speaker and I mentioned his name already and I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Frank Holtz from the University Eye Clinic in Bonn. Good morning, Bonn. How are you? Good morning, Stefan. A very warm welcome up in space there. And I understand we have no problem there, Houston. Thank you so much for having no problems. Um, Frank, you know, you visited pretty much all of the symposia and we went higher and higher. What are your expectations of today? I think we won't space out and uh, if I see the program, I really wish to congratulate you, Stefan, Monica, Anja and your entire team for setting up this spectacular program and meeting. It's really, it has always been a highlight in the yearly calendar, the ISS and now the VIS, the Virtual Imaging Symposium. It's really fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you so much for the kind words and joining that virtual format. And so I want to kick off your lecture, uh, Foveal Hypoplasia Revisited with Multimodal Imaging. Thank you so much, Stefan. So the topic for this lecture is a misshaped fovea in essence, and we will be looking at it from different imaging angles. And I wish to give special credit to Christina Hess for all their work in this field where we used again several imaging modalities to better characterize and came up also with some new findings in a particular disease entity. Now I wish to start with the first case, perhaps you can advance the uh, uh, the slides, yes, thank you. 18 year old male with good visual acuity, but he has some complaints of blurred vision. On the next slide, we see the fundus image, which looks very innocuous. Next one here, we have the fundus autofluorescence, normal distribution of luteal pigment. And the next slide will give us the infrared reflection image, also looks normal. Next one, and here on the please forward slides, the clicker here from remote uh, does not work. There is a little bit also a hint that there's a temporal thinning on the retina temporal to the foveolar next slide, which is not normal uh, as we use the spectralis to image. Next slide, please. And here we also see that usually we have a centrifugal displacement of the inner nuclear layer and the inner plexiform layer. And here in the fovea, there is inner retinal tissue, which as a matter of fact, shouldn't be there at this site. Next slide. And the same holds true for the other one. And to cut a long story short, this was a patient with all pot syndromes. And we then had the chance to look at 28 eyes of 14 patients and look at their fovea because this has not been described, a misshaped fovea under these circumstances. And uh, the, uh, this disease, all ports, is based on a mutation in the collagen 4 gene. So we have an aberrant gene product of collagen 4 that obviously is the cause for these changes in the retina. Here is a homozygous other male, 17 year old, also a fundus image looks pretty normal. Next slide. And just click through, if I may ask for a next slide, please. Same, there was nothing uh, obvious on fundus autofluorescence. And here, again, on OCT, this peculiar phenomenon of a thinning of, of layers, of inner retinal layers temporal to the fovea. And there is an optic pit missing, obviously. And we see, again, inner retinal layers be present at the foveal tissue, while the ONL widening and the outer segment, uh, segment elongation looks pretty normal. Next slide. And here comes the surprise. Now, when we do OCT and shockography, it turned out that there is no foveal avascular zone, but that the, there is vascular tissue all over the place in the foveal or region where it actually shouldn't be there. So obviously there is a connect between the not happening displacement of inner retinal layers sentry fugally and with this sign of vascularized fovea, usually avascular zone. Next slide. And this is the other eye of the same gentleman. And we see a similar uh, picture here. There may be a little tiny bit area 
of avascular zone, but obviously grossly abnormal. And this is in presence of 2020 vision. So this is a huge surprise that here is a disconnect between morphological changes and the functional impact of those. Next slide. And interestingly, if we go down a bit deeper in the deep capillary plexus, there is an avascular zone. So it affects different capillary layers in a different manner, but this is also not entirely normal as there's a little bit of elongation of this FAZ in this patient in the deep capillary plexus. Next slide. And again, on function, no impact at all on micropyrometry. Fixation stability is fantastic. And also there's no evidence of uh, impaired retinal sensitivity in this context. And you may use then for the Allport syndromes, a pathognomonic change is the lenticonus. And it may be extremely subtle, but if you use the anterior OCT, you will pick it up readily. And this is shown here in this example in another patient with the Allport syndrome, see in the X chromosomal mode of inheritance. And there's a little bulging forward in the center of the lens. And again, very easily picked up, even if it's of, of uh, low grade change of, of the lens, you pick it up with the anterior uh, readily. Next slide. Now, one thing we were asking then with Wolf Hamling and Julius Amel and the AO Vision Lab here uh, in Bonn, does it impact cone packing, cone density? And he uses his adaptive optics uh, lab uh, to, to make cone quantifications, density measurements. Next slide. And when we look at the two mosaics in a normal as compared to a patient with all pot syndromes, there is also the typical hexagonal packing of the cones. It is a bit more blurry in the all pot patients as the vessels, uh, the, the lack of a foveal vascular zone makes it a bit more tricky. But interestingly, next slide, there is, and this is uh, the first time ever described, that there is a higher cone density outside the center. Usually there's migration of cones in the development of the foveola over time until uh, about 48, 45 months after birth. But obviously there is a higher cone density in these cases outside the foveola. And this may also, as fixation is happening place there, the reason for the good visual acuity. Next slide. Now, when we looked here at another patient, this was the heterozygous brother. So one allele only affected, next slide. And we were seeing if in a heterozygous state, next slide, there are also changes seen in the fovea fundus normal. Next slide. Autofluorescence looks a bit uh, depleted, but is still within the normal range. We see this also in other individuals. There's a hyperability, obviously, next slide. And we can move forward here in the infrared reflection image also looks entirely normal in this patient. Next slide. And with the OCT, this also looks normal. So obviously heterozygosity does not lend an aberrant collagen 4 protein. It does not lend if it's a heterozygous state to morphological change in the fovea. Next slide. Also shown on the OCT and geography, the fovea vascular zone is present and normal in this heterozygous state. Next one. Now we looked at, again, a total of 28 eyes in all pot syndrome, and there's a huge variability in terms of how the vascularization of the central bit is changed in this 52 year old patient with X chromosomal all pot syndrome, also 2020 vision, so not impaired, but you see this vessels, these capillaries marching basically to the foveola where they shouldn't be in the normal state. Next one. Next slide, please. And just to, to, to briefly recap, described by Arthur Cecil Allport, uh, it's uh, aberrant collagen 4 protein. The bulk of it is X chromosomal mode of inheritance, 10% autosomal recessive. They have usually renal problems. And as I showed with the anterior imaging, the lenticonus is pathognomonic, and there's also some other corneal changes. Next slide, please. And interestingly, this collagen 4 has been shown to be present in the internal, internal limiting membrane and also in Brooks membrane. So we can conclude, next slide, and the lens, of course, because of the lenticonus, that we find also in all syndrome, uh, 
misshaped foveal pit and it's worthwhile doing OCT and geography. That's the only way to really assess, readily assess the presence or absence of vessels in the foveolar and best cognitive visual acuity often is normal in these patients. Next slide. And there's another sign that we've seen here with the spectralis, the so-called staircase foveopathy. This is basically uh, the loss of tissue in the inner retina layer giving rise to this bumpy inner surface of the retina. And this is readily shown by structural OCT imaging. And again, if you see this in these patients, then look at also the shape of the foveal configuration as do an OCT and geography, which then may elicit and point towards uh, foveal hyperplasia. Next slide. Now, because the development of the foveal amascosone and the foveal pit are closely related, obviously it is interesting to know that collagen type 4 obviously plays an important role in foveal development and maturation. Next slide. And just recently, Mervyn Thomas from Leicester in the UK wrote a fantastic overview and also graded the different disease states and forms of severity of foveal hyperplasia. And there is some correlation with best corrected visual acuity. Next slide. And again, it is seen in various diseases. And just to recap, interestingly, it starts at the week 24 to 26 of gestation with a centrifugal displacement of inner retinal layers, then comes the central migration of cones, and it's not completed until 45 months after birth. So a relatively long process and an early arrest of this development can lead to the clinical sign of foveal hyperplasia. Next slide. Now I just throw in some other causes, and this I think is extremely interesting that very heterogeneous etiology can lead to a misshaped fovea to foveal hyperplasia. One example is albinism and almost all patients with albin ocular albinism do have uh, foveal hyperplasia and here it's obviously an aberrant melanin biosynthesis. Next slide. For PEX6 related aneuridia, uh, also a majority of cases do show the sign of foveal hyperplasia. Next slide. In achromatopsia, about half of the patients uh, show foveal hyperplasia. And interestingly, under these circumstances, the FAC can be preserved despite the presence of a thickening, of a continued thickening of the central bit of the retina. Next slide. So this just adds to the list uh, in uh, ROP, sticklers, fevers, fonda, and incontinentia pigmenti. Again, extremely heterogeneous causes but lead to the same phenomenon of early arrest of foveal development and maturation. Next slide. So to sum up, next click please. There are very different causes for the clinical sign of foveal hyperplasia. Next, we use OCT and OCT and geography, which are very useful tools to make a categorization on the severity of foveal hyperplasia as to the categorization and classification by Mervyn uh, Thomas from Leicester. Next, please. And of course, foveal hyperplasia and changes in the vascularization of the center bit often do correlate, but not too closely. So sometimes there's some degree of disconnect. Next, please. And again, interestingly, also, it looks entirely abnormal on OCT and geography and structural OCT and the uh, not existent foveal pit. Uh, still, it, it may have good or bad visual acuity, but it's always usually connected to a regular autonuclear layer widening and the lengthening. So if you have a your normal widening of the outer nuclear layer, and the lengthening of the outer segments, visual acuity usually tends to be good. Next one. Yes, and BCVA is determined by cone density. And as we have shown, and Wolf Harmonings and Dr. Amels uh, in the AO quantification of the cone density, it relates where the packing takes place. And interestingly, then the highest density may not be in the very center, but maybe 
outside. So obviously cone density is also affected in the context of Alport syndrome by the production of an aberrant collagen for protein. And with this next slide, please, I do wish to thank you for your attention again. Again, my congratulations to Stefan and his team for the fantastic VIS meeting 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I was allowed by the captain to change to the cupola, which is a, uh, the other observation module here. Um, what you don't see, and this is why I'm cut off of here, two people have to hold my feet down that I'm not rotating. You see, I'm a little bit unstable. If I do a little move, I go to one or the other direction. And if I see right, I'm not sure behind me, if, if people can see that, hold on, I may have to go in this direction. I think we are flying over Europe as we speak at the moment. Anyway, um, thank you for this great talk. We have a couple of questions. The first question that comes on my screen is, thank you, Professor Holtz, for this great overview of uh, all of these uh, variations of foveal hypoplasia. Is there, between all these different entities, um, an underlying mechanism why the fovea is underdeveloped? Well, this is obviously an excellent question. And as a matter of fact, the molecular mechanisms leading to a not normal maturation of, of the foveola are quite poorly understood. So in all the entities I mentioned, the molecular cause and the genetic causes are well defined. And uh, in ROP, usually, of course, there are no genetic factors, but other things playing in. But then what drivers, for example, this peculiar phenomenon that cones march into the center, what is the driving force and mechanics by telling the cells to march into the center to get the highest packing that you can ever get to reach the best resolution of your foveola is, is really completely not understood. It's interesting because almost it's a it's almost not a bug, it's a feature. If they concentrate in the center of the fovea, it's like eye hawk or something. I don't know how that compares to the configuration of the fovea with birds, etc. But as far as I know, uh, that's quite uh, similar. So, uh, but that's just an innocent comment of myself. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, um, uh, we have uh, two more questions really at the moment popping up and I want to encourage other speakers if you want to add something, comment something or ask a question in this session, please raise your hand and Paul can bring you in any time to ask directly Frank a question. However, we have two more questions as far as I can see um, and it's related to, well, probably clinical practice. How often do you see them and what you're really doing with those patients? So this is a two-part question, please, maybe. Yeah, very, very good question. Well, again, fortunately, quite a high proportion of those patients have good visual acuity, particularly, particularly in the context of Allport syndrome. But then there's really no active intervention. Once the fovea is is formed, that's that's sort of irreversible. There's no way to tell then the inner retin layers, inner nuclear, inner plexiform layers to do this centrifugal march outside again. It's it's as it is for the time being for the affected individuals, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, um, that was, I think that was kind of answered that question uh, or not answered because we don't know why the cones move in that direction. Uh, um, I just want to, because it's asked again, ask that question again. Any idea why, why they are moving? And uh, secondly, uh, probably what is about progression? Are they then, if the fovea is, is configured, is that the same for the entire life or are there still um, uh, late-term effects you can observe? Uh, that's a brilliant question. You, we would love to see repair modes. If So if it's somehow noticed in a regulatory system that the packing is not sufficient to give rise to optimal visual acuity, then to correct this later would be ideal. But evolution in these million years obviously has not thought out already such a repair mechanisms and again it's it's a very fascinating area we still have major gaps of knowledge here and by the high resolution imaging using the spectralis platform of course we can much better understand it and follow it in early days but again huge gaps of knowledge which makes it even more interesting perhaps <laughs> 
Thank you to Bonn. Uh, we are at the end of this uh, talk. Uh, again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the rest of the session. And as I said, if you have questions or comments, we might see you back in a few minutes. So thank you very much thank to Bonn. So